Okay, internet, hello. My name is Nick Thompson, and today I am super excited to introduce to you Elementary Audio. Elementary is two things. First, it's a JavaScript runtime based on Node.js for native audio applications. And this is JavaScript, but this is not web audio. This is really desktop audio, mobile, embedded Linux, um, VST, AU, AX, you know, all of the plugin formats you need. This is really native audio applications written in JavaScript. Elementary is also a functional declarative framework for composing audio DSP applications. And so to really explain what Elementary is, why I'm interested in it, and why I think we need a new tool for writing audio software, I want to start with my central thesis, which is that writing audio DSP is hard. And maybe writing audio DSP is too hard. And what I really mean by that is that I think it's hard enough to write audio DSP and write audio software that it prevents smart people from making audio software. It creates divergent paths for the way that we prototype and the way that we ship. And it means that smart people spend way too long trying to write their products. And I find this unfortunate and frustrating because, in my opinion, so many of the challenges of writing audio DSP have nothing to do with DSP. Um, and so just to name a few here, we've got protecting the real-time thread, multi-threading, data races, memory management, object lifetimes, compilers, build chains, platforms, etc. cetera. Um, these are difficult problems to solve when we're writing audio applications, but these, are, these have nothing to do with audio itself, right? Like these problems aren't inherent to writing audio applications. Um, these are software problems, not audio problems. And so maybe I could zoom into the audio domain here a little bit more and find a better set of problems to, to discuss in our slides. So for example, um, maybe you know, I hit, I hit several of these questions when I was kind of making my way into the field of audio software. Do I update these variables at the block level or sample level? Why is my filter zippering when I run, run it over two channels? How do I write this code to make sure that the compiler will vectorize it, etc.? And again, you know, these are problems that we face in the day-to-day -day of, of writing audio software, but, but these, are, these are not audio problems. This is still low-level native programming problems. Um, and that just happens to be the way that we write audio software today. And so, really, I think that writing audio DSP itself can actually be simple, fast, and fun. Um, and I think that we can leave behind all of those problems that I just mentioned. And I think that if we do that, and if, if we can accomplish making software that allows us to write audio DSP such that it's simple, fast, and fun, then I think that we'll lower the barrier to entry for writing audio apps. I think we will decrease the time to market for an audio application, and I think we'll reduce the number and the complexity of the bugs that we encounter as we write these applications. And so, you know, to revisit each of these in a little bit more detail, for the first case, I think a lot about myself um, when I was just getting, into, just getting into audio software. I mean, I started my career as a web developer, and for many years, I knew that I wanted to get into audio software, but I felt like I had the wrong skill set, or I felt like, um, you know, maybe I wasn't smart enough, or at least that it would be really hard to make that transition from a career perspective. Um, and I think that if the, if the tools and the workflow was more accessible, was easier, um, then I think that there's a lot of people in kind of a similar position who would get into writing audio software more readily. Um, and for the time to market bullet, um, you know, really what I think elementary can do is uh, I want to eliminate this gap between prototyping and production um, so that we don't spend up, like time and energy prototyping our software in one way and then rewrite our software in a different way to take it to market. Um, and reducing the number and the complexity of the bugs, I mean, I think that if we can leave behind the, the problem set that we just worked through, um, then the types of bugs that, that we may encounter are of a different category. And I think, you know, generally, the, the problems that we just talked about are really difficult problems, um, and they take time, and encountering them in the field is tough, um, and I think we can avoid them, really. So here really is where the idea for elementary <laughs> was born. 
Um, and so now what I want to do is, is go through some of the, the design goals of elementary in the context of the problems that we just discussed. So step one for the design goals of elementary, decouple DSP from the complexities of, of low-level native programming. Um, and really this is make our departure from that whole problem space that I just mentioned earlier. Once we've done that, step two is to rethink the way that we want to express audio DSP processes. And so with elementary, the way that we'll write applications is declarative, functional, reaction, sorry, reactive, um, where pure functions are the, cure, are the core unit of abstraction, which means that we have like true functional composition like you have in a Lisp. Um, and with elementary, you can write your signal flow once as a pure function of your application state and let the system handle the rest. And this is really a pattern that has become dominant in the web technology realm, um, but I haven't seen it leave that realm so much. Step three is eliminate the gap between prototype and production. So, you know, my prior two slides, um, there's been a lot of work in the industry that has, has you know, tackled these bullets before, right? Like Max MSP, Pure Data, Reactor, you're not working at the low level native programming space when you work in those tools um, and, and the Faust programming language as well. Um, so already we have been exploring this like departure from those problems and then a new way to think about our DSP. But in, in each of these cases, you know, in my experience anyways, people and myself included will work in a tool like Max MSP or Reactor or Faust for prototyping. And then once they have a prototype that they're happy with, a clear design, they'll kind of start over in C++ to write the production version. Um, and that's a bummer. That's such a waste of time. So with elementary, you know, you work in JavaScript, you can, you can write your application using the command line tool, but because it's Node.js, you can integrate a custom GUI in a number of different ways. And then, you know, one of the major goals was that once you have finished your, your prototype, your application in JavaScript, you can take the elementary embedded SDK and put that wherever you need, inside a plugin, inside your custom you know, Linux hardware stack, uh, inside your desktop application stack, wherever you need. And then you can take that same JavaScript file that you just worked on and kind of pop it right in. And so with this, by the time you're done writing your prototype, you're really so close to ready to ship. And then lastly, step four, make it accessible. So with elementary, we're just talking about JavaScript. We're just talking about Node.js. You don't have to learn a dedicated DSL to write your DSP, which means that you don't have to you know, think and work in one way to prototype your software and then think and work in another way to ship it. Or you don't have to think and work in one way to write the DSP part of your software and then think and work differently to write the rest of it, you know, the GUI and the business logic. Um, so this is just JavaScript, the whole thing. Um, and, and because this is Node.js as well, we kind of immediately have access to all of the best tools and workflows from that community, from that ecosystem. And really, I think that the Node.js ecosystem has put forth some of the best developer tooling um, and workflows, at least that I have, have been able to work with in my career. Um, and all of this stuff is immediately accessible through elementary, which I think is really exciting. So there we have the design goals. And now I want to take you through a couple of code examples to show you what it looks like to work in elementary. So first example here, this is the hello world of DSP. This is just making a sign tone. Um, and so this is a JavaScript file that we're looking at. This is a complete elementary program. Um, and so we start with our require statements like any old Node.js script. And then we have this cycle function where we take a, a frequency argument and we return a phaser running at that frequency multiplied by 2 pi. And then we take the sign of that signal and send the result out. So you can see we have this core dot on load, and this is kind of waiting for you know elementary to get the driver up and running so that we're ready to, to pump audio out. 
And at that time, we call core.render and we pass it uh, two channels, a left and a right, of our cycle function running at 440 hertz. And so that's it. You can, you can write this, you can save it to your drive, and then execute this file from the elementary command line tool, and you will hear a stereo sine wave. Um, and cycle here, actually, as written, is it is actually an included library function, so you could even remove that whole function declaration and just call el.cycle. So, um, example number two, we're doing exactly that. There is no cycle function. We're using the provided el.cycle with the same interface. Um, but this time, we're not rendering a sine tone and then, you know, walking away. In this case, once the driver's up and ready, we set a timer so that every 500 milliseconds we'll render something new. And so in this case, we render, there's only, we're, we're only using a single mono channel here, but in this case, we are going to construct a cycle, but every 500 milliseconds, we're going to change the frequency that this cycle is running at. And this is not a very musically compelling example, you know, random frequencies <laughs> between 440 and 880, but um, but I think the interesting thing here is that five, every 500 milliseconds, we're changing our audio signal, our audio flow, right? And we're just handing this over to elementary with core.render, and elementary will take care of the rest. So here really demonstrates that you can write your signal flow, you know, once as a function of your application state, and we'll explore this more even in the next example, um, and let the system handle the rest. So this here is an abbreviated um, polyphonic sine tone synthesizer. And it's abbreviated because I'm omitting uh, primarily this update voices function. But in general, we start with a voices array that can be as long as you want. And each voice has a gate and a frequency, which are the important pieces. <clears throat> now, this time after we've got the load event, we set a new event handler. And this is for MIDI input. So with this file, once you're running this with elementary, elementary has wired up all of the MIDI inputs that it can find on your computer. And you can start you know, playing your MIDI keyboard and this function will execute with every MIDI event. So we get an event, we call update voices. And in this case, really all that update voices would do is, you know, in a simple case, check for a note on or a note off and it would basically allocate the voices in the voices array above, turning gate values to one or to zero accordingly, setting the frequency values according to the note that's coming in. And once we have our updated voices array, we just call core.render again, right? And so this time with core.render, we are mapping each of those voices through just another cycle running at the voices frequency, and then we multiply that by the voices gate. So this is on or off, basically depending on whether that voice has been allocated or, or you know, whether there's a key down for that voice. Um, and we map, we map the voices across this function and we sum them up. So this here is a working, really simple polyphonic sine tone synth. And then the last example, it's really basically the same exact thing, but I wanted to show sample playback. And so here, instead of, um, you know, cycle frequencies, we have sample paths. And so you can see the primary difference is this el.sample function, which takes a set of properties, one of which is this path to the file that we want to trigger. And then the voice.gate is an input to the sample playback. So the sampler will trigger, uh, will trigger playback on the rising edge of that gate signal. So when the gate goes from zero to one. Um, and so similar thing here, you know, you can make that voices array as long as you want. You can put whatever file paths you want. And then here we have a, you know, totally MIDI enabled sample playback engine. So that's all I want to show today as far as code goes. Um, and I want to say that I'll be announcing the public beta very soon. And I'm also going to be doing a couple more videos elaborating on these examples, showing some new things, um, and really hopefully making some pretty interesting stuff because, you know, I can only fit so much in a presentation slide. <laughs> um, and, uh, and obviously, you're going to want to hear it as we're working on it. So that's coming up. Stay tuned for that. 
And I also want to call out um, two Discord servers, one of which I just spin up. This is, I just sp spun up. <laughs> this is the elementary audio Discord server, um, specific for, you know, I'll be sharing announcements in here. I'll be inviting kind of early user feedback, feature requests, um, kind of support sort of things. Um, and if you jump in, if you jump into that channel right now, you can get involved in the private beta, which is macOS only. Um, and then also, I want to call out the audio programmer Discord. Of course, I'm in this channel all the time. It's amazing. Um, you can jump into either one of these. Hit me up if you're interested. I am at Nick, and uh, I'd love to chat with you. I'd love to get your get you involved and and uh, hear what you think. So that's it for today. Thank you so much, and I will see you for the next video.